those with a monogram on them. Okay, we're going to get started here. Uh, I'm Josh Drum, Community and Economic Development Specialist for the City of Montpelier. Welcome. Uh, for those on Zoom, thank you for Zooming in. Um, we have a small crowd here tonight, not as big as Saturday, but um, we're going to start with a presentation from our consultant, Stephanie White. Uh, Stephanie and Clark. Stephanie Clark. <laughs> that happens a lot. <laughs> uh, and then we'll do some Q&A. Uh, first, we'll take questions after from members in the audience here first. If they could please um, come up here to the microphone, or if you don't want to walk up to the microphone, you can project from your seat and it should pick, pick it up. Um, after there's no more questions from the audience, we'll go to Zoom uh, to answer their questions. So um, I'll introduce you to Stephanie from Wittenberg. Great, thank you. Um, good to see you all here today and to see you on Zoom. Um, as Josh said, I'm Stephanie Clark from Whitenburg, and I'm representing our team, the consultant team that was hired by the city. Uh, Whitenburg paired up with VHB, which are um, engineers who do the environmental and the site work, the site assessment, as well as um, BRD, but lack of design, the architects helping on the planning and assessment as well. Did you want to pull up the slides as well? Um, so we've been, we have been hired to help shepherd this process and then get into the planning for the master plan. We, tonight I'm going to talk about the process and we have a slide deck here, um, minimal slides, but just for um, the audience here in person and on Zoom. Um, that will come up shortly for you on Zoom. And the uh, purpose is to explain the process and to talk a little bit about what we're planning to do for the next few months, several months, and the different points of engagement for the community, and also then tonight to take a good amount of time to hear input, questions, priorities from the members of the public. So that's what we'll get into. And first off, the property has been known now by a few different names, uh, the Elks Club property, it's also been known as the 203 Country Club Road site. Um, we are calling it the Country Club Road site, the 203 kind of being less relevant. So the Country Club Road site is its working title. So you may hear that interspersed with the old name too, but we're trying to keep it consistent for the purposes of a holding, really a holding pattern until we have an, an actual plan and a vision for the site that may beget its own name and have its own identity. Uh, I guess, are we good with the slides? Okay. Um, so the timeline um, here that you can see, um, are you going to do it as a show or is that not possible? I know it's sometimes hard to run it at the same time, but yeah, it doesn't matter, just to make it bigger. Yeah. Um, so so what we're here to talk about today is, is the actual process a little bit. We have not quite gotten into any of the site data um, that's forthcoming, which I'll explain. Um, so I kind of know what you know now about this uh, property. So starting back in the spring, the city was involved in putting this to a vote uh, for the purposes of housing and recreation. It was then there was pub a public meeting and a public input period and all of that input was collected and now we have, it's on the website, all the input collected up to September is on the website. And then over the summer, the RF an RFP went out to hire a team and that's when we came on board and started to begin, begin the assessment process and then start doing some of the um, additional listening sessions. So right now in fall 2022, we're continuing to take community input and start talking about prioritization about people's interests in the site and how to use it for in perpetuity. You know, what is the long-term vision for the site? At the same time, concurrently, we're doing the site due diligence, and that is the looking uh, at all the natural resources, taking before the snow flies, you know, get the inventory of natural resources, look at wetlands assessments, look at the topography, look at all of the things you need to know about the, the foundation of the site to know what the, the site is actually entails. And once we have that information, we're putting together what's called an opportunities and constraints plan, which is really going to show where the developable areas are in, on the site. Um, there may be some undevelopable areas, whether you know whether that's caused by um, it could be topography, it could be um, primary agricultural soils that are really hard to um, you know we have to be very careful around. Um, so there could be some 
some some constraints like that, and then there's opportunities where there's just really um, you know excellent conditions. So we have to think about that, but layering it with the public input, and that's the winter phase, and we're really focused on creating a very robust public input period during that phase where people have something to respond to and we're looking at the qualities of the site that we can then talk about more constructively with all of the uses that the, that the town, um, that all the, the folks in the community have envisioned. So we'll be doing public workshops, lots of outreach in different ways, so not just some charrette style meetings in public, but also some stakeholder engagement at places where maybe some people haven't ordinarily gotten a chance to have input, um, doing a lot more education and outreach, trying to find people to um, educate with fly, you know, information flyers or a packet, um, possibly a survey at that time. Coming out of winter though, once we have a, few, a little more direction from city council who will, then, who will be taking up all of that public input, we plan to come back with two to three concept plans and kind of development pathways that we can talk about again in a series of public sessions that are going to really look at um, looking at pros and cons of different scenarios, including cost, high level magnitude cost estimates. You know, some possible scenarios may require quite a bit of infrastructure for the city to implement, to, to invest in, and maybe that's worth, worth it for the vision we're looking for, but um, that's a cost, and so we have to look at those in comparison. So that's going to be the public feedback process, and then following that, um, the city council will make a, a decision and a guiding, a guiding decision that will come together in an actionable master plan that the team will create that will have a series of recommendations and next steps for further phases, such as um, you know, looking for financing sources to do the infrastructure that we want to do, possible rezoning of the property, possibly getting an extension of certain um, designations like your growth center boundary or um, maybe a new town center boundary. We don't know. Right now, it's too early to presume. We have this timeline set. The winter phase, the reason we're leaving it more broad is because after we do the initial set of meetings, we may find we need additional research. For example, um, traffic, if you know, we, some of the design or some of the concepts that come out have some of the development in, in one node of the site, that may be a very different traffic impact than a different node of the site. And so we may want to go back and do a little more research. And if that's the case, then we might come back and do it iteratively a few times with the public over the winter time frame, so that then where we come out in the spring, it may be early spring, it may be late spring as a result. And it may be early summer before the actionable master plan is is released. We don't want to rush this process. That's something we've been, um, that's been encouraged by the city council not to rush this because we want to see what the public process, how it unfolds. We can't presume to know how that will unfold. Uh, next slide, I think. So as I mentioned, the public has had a chance to do some input, to offer some input. It has ranged, um, as you can see on the public document. We also have some handouts over on the table over here including the public comment um, that has been received to date. So folks in the audience are welcome to take that with them. It ranged a lot, um, what we'd heard so far, everything from housing and recreation, which is what was, um, it was intended for in the vote, but also agriculture and environmental conservation and stewardship, as well as retail out there. So, you know, that's a, there's a lot of different uses that have been suggested, and some are not in direct cooperation. You know, there's a higher priority for some people up for housing and not so much recreation, and some people want more recreation than housing. So, you know, of course this is not going to be a site that can, it's only 138 acres, it can't uh, satisfy every need of the community, but it's good to hear all those different voices and see how that can come together and really create um, a vision that, that works for the city. I should say that one of the things we, we could end up seeing is a phased approach where you don't master plan the entire thing all, at the, all in 2023. Because maybe, because this is a legacy site and it does have a long, um, we want this to have a long lasting impact and you don't know what all your needs will be over the next few, you know, next several years and decades, maybe there's an opportunity to reserve um, for future phases land that gets developed later. So maybe, I don't know, but I just put that out there because it, that's what we, we talk about a legacy site. We're looking at a long impact of this property. And I 
think that brings us to the question for tonight. Um, you know, what we'd like to hear from the public tonight is what do you want most for this property and what are some of your concerns? What are some of your concerns even about the process if you want to um, speak to those and there's a way we can accommodate those or suggestions about how we can find people to get the most input we can during that winter phase. We're all ears, we're, we're actively updating our outreach plan that is an outreach document that has lots and lots of um, sources or uh, spaces where we can find people and we're kind of starting to just create this directory of how we get in touch with folks. So if you have ideas about that, we're open to that as well. Um, I think that's pretty much it that I wanted to say just to open it up, but if you want to go to the next slide, we. We have a map of the site tonight um, in the audience here. It's a little hard to see because of the lighting, but you can see East Montpelier Road at the bottom of the screen. You've got these two wooded nodes on either end, um, kind of bookending the site with the golf course in the middle. And you can see at the bottom, and I'm not doing a great job of pointing because I'm a far away, but down there, oh, thanks, Josh. There's the, 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 um, the Elks Club building itself. And part of the, um, I should have added that during the site assessment phase, the, pub, the building will also be assessed for reuse, reusability. So how can it be possibly repurposed? How much of the building is you know, um, sustainable or reusable? Uh, that can vary a lot, and that's out of my expertise. That's the architects um, that will look at that. But if you know a recreational use is needed, is, is desired for that part of the site, could it be reused as a rec center? Could it be added on to? Is it suitable for housing? So forth. So we have to look at that too, and that's why Black River Design, one of the reasons Black River Design is on the team. Is there anything else I've missed to kind of cover? So for, with that, we'd love to take input. Um, we'll leave the map up because it's an easy enough place to kind of point to if folks have questions or concerns. And yes, and if you would just state your name and where you live to help us orient, that would be helpful. You are welcome to speak from the audience if you project or you can use the mic. Uh, Phyllis Rubenstein, College Street, Montpelier. I um, really appreciate this presentation and I have a question at this point. Who have you hired to do the natural resources assessment? That's all coming from VHB. And what is VHB? They're um, in South Burlington. They um, do all manner of engineering, environmental resources, environmental engineering, and consulting. Um, it stands for Van S. Hengen Bruslin, but nobody knows it by that. Say that again? It's VHB. If you go, it's it's not known by its longer name anymore, really. Um, so. VHB out of South Burlington and um, the team we have there is um, going in. They've already gone in actually and started the work because they had to do it before the ground froze to be able to do that work. Do we have any other questions or comments from the audience before we proceed? Okay. Um, Matt Wilson and I live in Berlin. Um, so from my perspective, working for the Community Service Department, um, one of the things that I noticed was uh, that worked really well is our fee senior meals. Um, we host um, Meals on Wheels every week, deliver meals to the public. Um, and I'm just wondering if there are opportunities to use the kitchen to do communal meals, if there is housing, or possibly congregate meals as a an opportunity to bring folks to that site. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. People in line here. People in line here. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, so if we don't have any more further comment right now. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Phyllis Rubenstein. Um, I am one of the people that feels very strongly that the country club property is, uh, is unique and that it should be preserved as much as possible for conservation purposes, uh, recreational purposes. I, I certainly think that agricultural purposes are um, also a good idea. In terms of education, certainly school groups can go up there for educational purposes. I don't think it would need a building I am not in favor of any 
large housing project or development. I've, I've heard that there's been some talk about rezoning so there could be 400 units in that property. The infrastructure would be massive, the roadways, um, and we're talking about an area where, which is, um, as you mentioned, it's bookcased by two forested uh, lots. Uh, behind it is all forest as well, so it's actually forested on three sides. Below it, there is a wetland. There is a small brook that runs through it. Um, if one goes there any time of the year, you will see um, that the deer, deer in the winter, you can see where the deer beds, where the deers have bedded down. You can see their droppings. Um, there are, it's alive with birds and small mammals as well. So it's a very important wildlife corridor for Montpelier. And I, I think that if, if that is highly developed, we will just be seeing more uh, deer and bears in our neighborhoods. I live on College Street. There were bear in, in, in the College Street area last spring and summer. And they're going to have nowhere else to go. And um, so I um, hope that the, I, I just quickly looked up VHB. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I did not see any listing of who their naturalists, who their biologists and botanists are. Uh, several years ago, I think in around 2007, Brett Angstrom did a natural habitat survey for the city, uh, for Montpelier, for the Montpelier Conservation Commission. And um, I think it would be very important to take a look at the uh, natural habitats, wildlife corridors that have been already identified and, and make sure that those are preserved as much as possible. I would hope that any development, if it takes place, is along the roadways that are already, that already exist. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, something that you said actually reminded me I wanted to mention, um, and then we'll get to, um, we're gonna open it up to the comments on, for folks on Zoom. Um, one of the things we will be looking at when we, when we look at opportunities and constraints and when we start developing the concept plans is really the context of the site too, because you make a great point that it's bordered by other woods, it's bordered by other natural uh, corridors and um, trails, and so we have to look at the site within its context, and we have to look at the site um, relative to the other infrastructure around it, and so we absolutely, um, we will you know, be looking at that and taking that into the whole consideration of the, pic the big picture. So I appreciate your comment and I appreciate the opportunity to hop back in with that. So with that, I'd like to turn it to, um, any, okay, we have one more comment in the audience and then we'll go to those on Zoom. Sure, I'll get more than one. Uh. First is a question, is the uh, printout include the comments from this past Saturday? It does not, it's up to September. Okay. When we are finished with this whole process, uh, we will be putting together a new document with all of the new comments. So I, with it, without seeing the environmental limitations of the property, of its drainage and its slopes and its ledge, et cetera, it's really hard to brainstorm about what might be possible but in the sense that it is not located in the village center where i went to planning school here in montpelier at woodbury college and it there's this emphasis for decades of like we're going to try to infill in our village centers mm -hmm. and we don't have a ma our master plan is woefully out of date dating back to what 2000 10 maybe, 2009. And so we're basically not working with a full deck here. Um, we really need to understand what we're gonna be able to do in town before we start overbuilding areas that might logically be preserved. Um, if, if we were to develop 
this large property, um, it should be more like a, a satellite downtown of a, a maybe two or three clusters of housing with mostly open space. Um, again, not informed by the limitations of the, the, the physical site. Um, I would like to see, I'm told it's troublesome from a discrimination point of view, I'd like to see uh, priority be given to folks that are here uh, because they were, we're, we're gonna see in the next decade a, an influx of climate refugees that are gonna swamp New England. And to just tolerate and displace all the local people, you know, and hope that some of the people coming here will want the jobs uh, is, is folly. I think we really need to get serious about possibly rent control, infill, we might need to exercise some eminent domain. We need to look at the, uh, what's the property that FoodWorks is on? Um, whatever that road is, home, home Farm Road? Home Farm Road property. I mean, we, uh, we also have immediate needs. I'm glad that person mentioned the kitchen. Uh, I noticed on Saturday the third set of public bathrooms that are constantly locked to the public. We've got a lot of unhoused people in this town and city hall bathrooms are egregiously locked most of the time. Uh, very selfish on the behalf of staff. Uh, very neglectful to watch the sewerage run into the river. Uh, same at Transit Center. Those are public, the, the city owns that building. Those bathrooms need to be available. These bathrooms. We could potentially, we might have 100 unhoused people as the hotel problem. So we might should, cons I don't know who's mutin muting. Um, we might have a real problem this winter that this could provide some cushion uh, for a period of months um, that needs to be considered. Um, but the kitchen, making it available, making potential bathrooms. I would start now putting a shower or two in there. Um, I mean, we've, we've, we're paying for this. This is our, our property and we really need to get our priorities shuffled. It's nice to have the luxury of a you know, year long design charrette, but we've got immediate needs that are, have been long neglected. So thank you. Thank you. All right, let's, uh, let's open it up to some folks on Zoom. I've not done this before. How you guys do this? <laughs> uh, okay, Shana has a question. Hi, I'm yeah, I'm Shana Casper. Um, I issue pronouns. I'm the uh, chair of the Montpelier Social Economic Justice Advisory Committee, where we have been. Can you hear me? Okay, sorry. Oh, okay. I just heard something. Some feedback. Um, and, uh, the Montpelier city, Con uh, we were supposed to meet on this this morning, but, um, our regular <laughs> scheduled meeting wasn't warned. So thank you so much for that heads up, Josh, and apologies that we weren't able to connect ahead of time. Um, so we got started in 2018 because, um, we wanted to, uh, the, the city wanted to address, um, and reshape the systems and policies and practices that perpetuate these barriers to social and economic justice in, in, in our committee including identifying and nurturing potential projects and policies and opportunities that address um, you know, systemic oppression and, and work towards greater equity in, the, in, our, in our city. And included in that is engaging, I really want to, I'm here today to really speak about the, our, our, um, of, of the outreach and the um, participation process um, of really wanting to make sure that we're engaging in a really broad range of city residents. And I recognize that this is, this is the, the first step um, um, and of, of building really deep and authentic uh, and longstanding partnerships with other um, working groups or communities of working towards equity and justice to build these long-term um, far-reaching projects and goals and developments to, you know, ultimately long-term to uh, continue to build and increase equity and justice in Montpelier. So a couple of years ago, we developed um, a equity a budget equity assessment tool, um, of which I think some questions that um, could be used in kind of lists of different communities could be could be really helpful. Um, so of 
you know, just continuing to ask kind of throughout the process of like, what are the social, economic, and racial justice impacts of this budget, of this decision on marginalized populations in our community who will benefit or be burdened by these decisions? And what strategies are there to mitigate any unintended consequences of these decisions? And if none exist, how to create them? And recognizing that having people participate in answering those questions and in, in participate in in that process is really powerful and part of the ensuring that the process centers people most impacted. And one of those things that we've been working on, which we're really, really excited and proud of, and we want to just get out at every opportunity possible, is that we now have stipends for participation in city committees. Um, and so these stipends can be used um, for anyone um, to or if you're a member of a city committee, um, regardless, you don't have to do any needs testing. It's you know you can use it for um, for dinner or for ordering in dinner or for childcare or whatever is needed to support your participation in the city committee. Um, and think that some sort of um, stipend process could be really beneficial for for this process as well. Um, you know we've we've kind of got it's it's a first come first serve budget and uh, line item from the city council and. Um, at last check, we, we, we are doing, we have plenty um, reserves there um, for this process. Um, so yeah, so just wanting to continue to kind of like identify those questions of who is impacted by these decisions, what are the potential positive and negative impacts, and what are the, um, um, you know, not recognizing that some of the negative impacts could, are, are you know, deal breakers to use that language, but more of um, but the, what, is, what is the plan for engaging and for mitigating with that. And just recognizing, you know, some of the key communities that we want to ensure are participating in this process um, are, um, you know, people of color, Black, Indigenous, people of color, you know, refugees and undocumented immigrants, um, LGBTQIA plus community, people experiencing homelessness, people struggling with substance abuse disorder, people with low or no income, people without access to reliable transportation, people without internet connectivity, um, people having mental or physical disabilities. Um, victims of domestic violence, um, and children and seniors. So um, just to really uh, ensure that we're, we're um, uh, wanting to support this process, we've been working with consultants who have kind of separate lists that we can email out about the process and um, yeah, looking forward to, to continuing to have this um, you know, robust engagement. Thank you, Shana. Um, I appreciate that comment and um, it highlights that I didn't get into, I had a note and my slides aren't in front of me, sorry. So um, talking a little bit more about our, um, this October, November outreach process and this, the different ways we're trying to gather input at this phase. Um, and then, you know, setting that as one of the first stages for an even more robust, as I said, we're trying to accumulate lots of different sources and ways to, um, distribute that in the winter time frame. But one of the pieces of that was um, we are meeting, I believe we're going to have a meeting soon with the committee chair, um, committee chairs, not just um, CJAC, but also homelessness, homelessness committee and um, housing committee. To And for exactly that, I was really scrabbling questions down. So I think mean, my notes are going to be a little shady and it'll be good to meet with you to actually get those at, because that's the exact kind of feedback and input we need right now on process as much as it is about the actual ultimate uses, um, because what we're doing now is building that infrastructure. So I really appreciate you, you mentioning that, and I look forward to meeting with you in particular and your committee um, members to, to kind of build that into the process and try to, you know, that's why we've been reaching out to, um, you know, folks about trying to find ways to access the senior community, possibly through um, the Meals on Wheels program when it gets to maybe the January process, having something to be able to be distributed that for people who may not want to participate online, who may not want to participate um, on an online survey. So all of those are really, really helpful. And I did not know about that budget and the stipend, so that's great to hear. I think we'll go to another comment yep. from Linda. Online. Can you explain the new screen? Linda, you can you have your, you have your hand raised. Yeah, sorry, I thought somebody else asked a question. Um, I'm Linda Young. I live on Winter Street, and I'm mostly just listening. But um, I will say I'm one of the people who declined to vote when we were voting on whether or not to make this purchase because I 
I heard both sides and thought both made compelling points. Um, it's exciting to have this piece of property, but I'm <clears throat> I'm concerned about. I mean, I don't. I honestly don't feel like we can afford to just hang on to another piece of undeveloped land. We've got our park land already, um, and we have unmet needs, as has been well pointed out. But my biggest concern about this piece of property is that it is not in the center of town, and that could potentially be an upside um, if we play our cards right. But I think the biggest concern is transportation, and I heard that loud and clear from a number of my friends who are challenged in that department. Um, and even from those of us who you know drive regularly but don't particularly want to get in the car if we don't have to. Um, <clears throat> so. I, I just want to put in a word for he, strong encouragement to focus on on how to solve transportation if we're really going to do something with this property. Thank you, Linda, and that um, is a message we've gotten a, a few times now to accessibility. Um, like you said, there could be some um, upsides to the to the area around it that it is serving, but there's an accessibility issue as well, and transportation issue. So. Thank you for that. I like the idea of having a you know another center, a second center, a satellite or something. But um, we need we need a way to get back and forth. Right. Alyssa. Yeah. Hi everyone. Alyssa Sharon. I live on uh, Isabel Circle in Montpelier. Um, it, thanks for having this meeting, and it's great to hear um, the uh, you know all the different perspectives and. Uh, I want to engage to talk a little bit about solar and the possibility of solar on the property, though I couldn't agree more with the transportation needs and um, also uh, would like to see um, and would support some form of housing on the site and would also love to see the bike path in some way connect directly to the site so that um, that increases the accessibility of biking and walking straight um, into that area. Uh, that said, my primary purpose of joining today was because um, I think in Montpelier, the city of Montpelier, I understand, has maximized the solar that they need and can do for the city. But there's a lot of nonprofits and churches and city buildings that would like to do solar but don't have sites that are viable. So I could imagine, uh, you know, the city having um, an area that is designated to solar that maybe they accept applications for from nonprofits or local um, businesses in town where, you know, we could lease land from the city to get some, uh, you know, renewable energy. I'm on the vestry at Christ Church in Montpelier. We would let, we have a donor who will invest in solar. We can't find a property to do it. And we've been looking for like a year. So it's um, when we're having that kind of, you know, challenge, you've got to imagine we're not alone and there's others in town that want to, to invest in solar too. And maybe there's an opportunity on this plot of land to do it. That would be a win for the city and win for a lot of local nonprofits or businesses in town who can't go solar. Point. Thank you, Alyssa. Peter? Uh yeah, yes, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Peter Kelman, I live on uh, Mountain View Street, uh, 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 all the way across the other side of town from uh, the site. Um, and uh, I went to the, uh, the first session on the site, and um, I just wanted to report a couple of things. One, I was struck by actually how little woods there was uh, actually on the property. Yeah, the property is surrounded by woods, but there's not that most of the, most of this property is open. Uh, and I think <clears throat> that's something which and, uh, everyone who is talking about natural uh, uh, space should, should, should check that out. Um, <clears throat> the second thing is um, I, I have children and grandchildren who live here in this town. And it was notable at the meeting um, in uh, uh, on the site that there was only one person, I would say, who was under the age of 60 or 65 um, at that meeting. And she actually made a very poignant statement about that. She said that young people don't feel welcome in Montpelier. 
Um, and uh, all of us gray hairs applauded her when she said that. We applauded her for her courage. Um, I, I think we've got to, in thinking about uh, uh, social and economic justice issues, also recognize that um, young people uh, with families are really disadvantaged compared to us older people who came along at a time when we could build up equity in our properties um, and, uh, and so forth. Um, I think housing, uh, okay, so then the other thing is, I have to say that at that session where a lot of people talked, I heard housing first, housing first, housing first. And you know what? Second was natural resources. And there was barely any talk about recreation, which I found to be quite interesting, since it is kind of, you look at it, you go, wow, this is a recreation place. But that seemed to be the sentiment that I saw. Um, finally, I would like to say, uh, because I'm on the um, uh, My Ride uh, uh, Community Advisory Group, there are obvious transportation solutions, My Ride being one of them. Uh, which is just in you know, its pilot year, but it's working very well, despite some grumblings that you might hear. And it basically is like a public transportation that works like Uber or Lyft. Um, it's not going to be hard at all to get to that place. Um, it, in some ways, it will be easy, as, as easy, certainly, as getting to the rec, rec center um, out uh, uh, on Elm Street, even though it's slightly further away. But I think there are much more natural connections and eventually, Savings Pasture is going to have some development, probably along Barry Street, um, and and with with um, uh, Caledonia Spirits and so forth. Barry Street's really sort of lengthening out. I think we're going to find that this is quite connected. Um, uh, 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 it, it will be quite connected. Thank you. Thank you. Just for context, Peter, the site contains about 80 acres of forested property and 50 acres of field. 80 acres, of, but but the, the forested properties are all the way to the right and all the way to the left. And everything in the middle is open, right? Yes. I know. Yeah, you can see it there on the map. The, and, and, the, and, the, and, and the and both the area to the left and the right, which are apps, I mean, they're they're undevelopable. They're they're gullies and so on and so forth. I think those would be great natural areas. I, I just don't understand why there would be any resistance to developing housing in the flat, the relatively flat area of the, that was the golf course. I'm not disagreeing with you right now, but hear anything. So thanks, thanks for your comment. Um, I think we'll go to Rachel and then we'll open it up if anyone else in the room had another comment. Yep. Rachel? I, know, I can't see if there's anyone else. Beyond. Uh, thank you. First, I want to thank Shana for um, what she said earlier and because I agree with everything that she said. Um, I have to say that it's a little difficult coming to a meeting with so little information. Uh, I've participated in these before, and then I have no idea what happened afterwards, what came out of those meetings. And so in some ways I feel like, why do I continue to come to these meetings when I'm not sure what the city is doing with the information that they want our input from. I can remember a few years ago, maybe five or so, they had uh, architects provide uh, schemes for how we might work Montpelier or how it might look. And it's like, what's come out of that? I mean, I, I, I just, there's that issue where I'm not sure what happens after we have several meetings. And then I've never heard of any plan that's already in the books and how much is that going to be looked at? Although I just heard that it's pretty outdated. Uh, it seems like these five-year plans should be looked at. <laughs> Uh, more frequently than that, because um, 
you know, the world is moving too fast now. Uh, it's, it's going faster than we can even take in what, what the changes are. And I have no sense of what's the preliminary work that's been done on this property? Has it been perked? I'm, I'm not sure of what is going to be allowed on this property. You know, what's going to be an obstacle? Uh, or we can dream all we want, but we don't know whether or not it's feasible because all of this preliminary, preliminary work hasn't been done. Uh, and I have also trouble with um, with definition, like what, you know, people are talking about affordable housing. Well, what does that look like? That could look very different from, from a lot of people. I mean, are we talking about, you know, middle-income families that can't afford housing? Or are we talking about unhoused folks or, you know, um, Section 8 housing? I'm, I'm uh, in my 70s now. I live in Montpelier. I forgot to mention that. And I live up on Freedom Drive. And as I get older and <clears throat> look at what's available around uh, not independent living, well, independent living, assisted living, you know, unless you have money, there is nothing around here. I mean, I worry about what am I going to do uh, when that time comes when I can't live by myself because I don't have the resources to be able to hire someone either to come in or to go to a facility because it's costing like, you know, upwards of 60,000 plus a year. And who has that kind of money? I've worked for nonprofits most of my life and, you know, I'm lucky to still be in my own home. So I just feel that for me to participate in something where I've been given no information is really putting me and everybody else at a disadvantage because um, we have no information whatsoever. And this is feels like just another one of those dream sessions. Uh, and then we'll have no idea what happens to those. So I'm not surprised that very early on there aren't more people participating people like to respond to something. And right now we haven't given anyone anything to respond to. So um, yeah, I, I appreciate your having this meeting, but I think in my mind, we need more information before we can even start thinking about what to do with this property. I have ideas, but I just, I, I don't even know that they're worth bringing them forward to tell, to, to be honest. Thank you. Thank you. And um, in case you weren't on at the very beginning um, of the presentation, we will have the video recording from this session and from the session that was held at the site on Saturday available for um, viewing. We're hopeful in the next week or so, we're still working on logistics, but that, um, in that, the beginning of this meeting, we talked about the process and where we are in the process and that the due diligence of the site itself um, requires time. And we were just hired to do that over in the fall period. So the public input up till September is available to review. Um, we are in this phase now and we'll be bringing back the, the site information in the winter time once we've had a chance to bring it all together because there's a lot to know about the site um, to some of the comments here tonight. There's a lot to the site. There's a lot of environmental um, features of the site. It's a big site. We want to make sure we're comprehensive about that foundation and have that foundational work available for the more um, the next step, which is going to be a more robust public process at that time. So I appreciate that comment. I um, want to open it up in case anyone in the audience hadn't had a chance to comment or had any questions or if anyone um, had any more questions from before. I just wanted to echo what Melissa had said about solar. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Greenspark. It is a sustainability park in Otterbury Center. Um, and it's an idea that I had 
thought of as a possibility because it could be both educational center um, for all ages, but also, you know, a potential energy source. And the three categories of exhibits they have at the sustainability park are renewable energy, sustainable transportation, and green building. So if there's possibly a model that could be worked into this space, it might be something interesting. Thanks. Um, you also um, reminded me of something else we wanted to say, which is to um, you specifically, because I know that you mentioned you're not from, you're not living here in Montpelier right now. And that's a part, that's a, a that's a community we want to make sure are are aware of this process, are able to provide input um, to some of the comments that were made on Saturday about housing access and equity here in the city. People want to live here and consider themselves part of the Montpelier community. And so we really want to make sure we're inclusive of those comments as well, um, because the hope is that this is going to enable more folks to live, work, play here in Montpelier. Um, so I men mentioned that primarily to ask any of you to get the word of mouth out too to anyone you might know, not just limit it to Montpelier residents, but people you know who consider themselves part of the Montpelier community. We don't want to be exclusive to residents only. So um, do we have any more comments from Zoom or in person? Yeah. So I, have, I have a question. Mm -hmm. I didn't attend the meeting on Saturday, but I actually was told that there was discussion of recreation use. And maybe this is a question to you, Bill, that um, I, or I, I'm not sure who answered the question on Saturday, but somebody m made a comment that the cross-country skiing would continue and other recreational uses would continue even during this evaluation and assessment process. Yeah, that's correct. Yes, all current use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, until... <clears throat> Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, so Phyllis just asked for those that couldn't hear and whether the existing uses, hiking, skiing, walking uh, on the site would continue during this evaluation period. And the answer is yes, everything will basically continue as it has previously. We're not going to make any major changes except for whatever we choose to do with the building. Um, and then obviously once more permanent things are built, uh, and there certainly, I think, is a serious consideration about what facilities, recreation type facilities could be there, whether it's our rec center, community center, senior center. Uh, there's a nonprofit group that is looking to partner with the city on developing, uh, you know, rec hub, they call themselves. Um, so that's all going to be evaluated in terms of need. Uh, and that's part of the initial planning. I'm speaking not just to, to you now, Phyllis Dell, um, a part of the initial planning uh, for this is getting these ideas so that when we get the site constraints and we start thinking about what might go there, we've got a sense already of what people are interested in and then can provide uh, some ideas for response. Anybody else um, on Zoom want to add another thing, more than one? Uh, Rachel, you have your hand up again. Um. It's interesting that since this property was purchased and the idea of having a, a housing on the property, I'm noticing that other people are bringing up possible other sites where we might put housing and what are things, you know, what's going to happen with, let's say, the state buildings because people are still uh, working from home. And so, you know, and then we've heard of a couple of possible projects on Northfield Street, one with uh, Habitat for Humanities and uh, Bove's brother buying and putting housing up there as well. Um, I'm wondering, is the city, city still working or will be including the changes that are happening already? within the city so that this project is not in isolation, uh, but that we're looking at making sure that we're staying current. I mean, I'm also here, we have a rec department that we're not doing anything with because it would cost too much uh, because of the remediation. 
And I'm also hearing a lot about schools that were putting more money in uh, because the infrastructure is, uh, you know, can't support. Uh, and what people are wondering, why are we putting more money into that? So I'm wondering what's happening with these projects that, you know, all that are already in place and people are feeling that they're not really supporting the community the way they need to. Um, I guess I just would hate to see that all of a sudden we've got like, you know, a couple of schools, an old rec department, I mean, uh, that are just empty and that there's gonna be a demand for a new school possibly. Uh, I don't know, I, I'm just, it just feels like, you know, I'm not gonna question whether or not it was a correct decision about buying this property, it's already done. I guess I just hope that moving forward, we have a little bit better idea of really what we wanna do and what's what we're capable of doing uh, because, you know, people want to come here, but we have to be able to afford to live here too. And there's a, I'm greatly concerned about that. Thank you. Um, so there's a lot to unpack there. I'll try to be as succinct as I can on some of the key topics. Uh, so with regard to housing, I think for the last several years, the city has identified and the residents have identified housing as really the number one priority. There's a severe housing shortage in uh, Montpelier specifically and really in Vermont in general, in part because of the cost of construction of new housing. So it's uh, we have a, a situation we've talked a little bit about not wanting people to cut. You know, well, it was commented. We don't want people to come in from out of state to buy up the properties. We don't want we want to make ourselves affordable. Yet the, the longer we have a scarcity of housing, that will drive the prices up in the market. That's what we're seeing in Montpelier now. Um, so without creating new housing, we will remain unaf unaffordable. And, you know, when you're not, and I'm not arguing for unlimited taxes, don't get me wrong, but when, in, in, when you're talking about mortgage and the price, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for a home, a, a little bit on one's annual taxes is, is a small amount compared to that in terms of the affordability of the community. So that's number one. So as a result, we've redone our zoning to make housing, make it more housing friendly. We're aware of private, uh, several private initiatives that you mentioned too. Uh, there are others, but until somebody puts in a permit and someone actually goes forward and builds them and they're on private property, even Savings Pasture is private property. So we can all sit and decide that that would be a great place for lots of things to happen, just like we could sit and talk about great places for state properties. Um, this is a property that the city owns. And so we actually can control the outcome and we can decide what we want to put there. And I think that was the opportunity. With regard, you mentioned the rec center. Uh, I don't want to go into great detail, simply that three years ago, it was going to be $6 million at least to renovate the existing center, um, meet the handicapped, uh, the accessibility requirements, meet the, you know, get rid of the asbestos and do those things in its existing location without really being able to expand its offerings. So one of the, you know, as we weigh the cost of new rec facilities, we have to sort of say, okay, because sooner or later, we're not gonna be able to use that building. It is, it's a failing building. It's gonna be closed down. Um, so we either have to, we either have to spend the money to do what needs to be done at 55 Berry Street, or we need to do something somewhere else. And this is an opportunity to weigh that, you know, those, that six, probably, probably seven or 8 million now against um, what it would cost to build a new facility and what we can, what the city can get from it. So I think it's important, you know, yes, you know, how do we with it? And then we can look at the opportunities for the 55 Berry Street. You know, earlier we talked about the needs for, for sheltering, the needs for showers, the needs for places to be. Um, that's a prime central location that could meet a lot of those needs. And I'm sure there are many other needs it could meet. So I think we have to look at our, our challenges and our opportunities. Um, with regard to uh, the other infrastructure issues, you know, we do have an old city. Uh, the school, I've not heard that the school was looking at a new building. Uh, they have not communicated that with us. Perhaps they are. 
Um, I, you know, I know they're looking at some of their on-site facilities, uh, their, their athletic facilities and those kinds of things, but I don't, I'm not aware that they're looking for a new school building right now. Although as a parent who had four kids going through the school system, they do have two very old schools and one of them, the middle school in particular, doesn't totally meet the needs, I'd say. I mean, it works, but it certainly isn't ideal, but they're, they're managing to make it work. So um, that's all I have to, but thank you for those questions. I can actually give a little bit of insight on the school element, just because I've been on the school board meetings. I think probably what they're referring to is they are going to have to do testing for a certain kind of chemical that I don't know the name of at the moment. And if it goes over that threshold, then there is going to need to be a lot of money spent to fix it. And that there's some funding from the state, but it's kind of rapidly going away because a lot of schools aren't meeting the threshold. That's kind of my interpretation of there's nothing, but that's kind of the idea. Um, we have, I guess I don't see anything more on Zoom. I did want to make, um, to, to clarify or to, to um, add some further notes about process two that I mentioned on Saturday, but just so that everybody has kind of the same information. I just had found this note that, you know, one of the things that um, this kind of spoke to what Bill was saying about the urgency of the housing crisis across the state. Um, one of the things that the a lot of communities in the state are doing now is actually taking a, a driver's seat role, the municipality themselves, in trying to create more housing stock and create more opportunities and economic development opportunities um, because it really does take all hands on deck. Uh, the numbers just don't work. That's why we're in this crisis. It's not because of um, we actually live in a state that has a lot of really very socially minded developers, but they are, they need to make a profit and there is an, even a reasonable profit can't be made. Um, and with these construction costs, especially in this current environment. So it's really taking all sources to make this happen. It's really taking all hands on deck. And so the municipality may choose to be, to invest in this if they want to see a certain vision. So the affordability and the term we heard on Saturday, classless housing, um, you know, the city may be wanting to take a, a more active role to invest in the infrastructure, for example, um, to make that possible. So that may be one of the considerations that comes up um, in this process when weighing out those pros and cons. Um, yeah, looking at the urgency of the need and then what that will take from the community to make that happen. So Without um, any further comment, what we'll do is we will try to get the, this recording and Saturday's recording on the website as soon as possible. Um, so in, if you have people you know, neighbors you know, who are interested, who want to view it, there's also another one of these opportunities uh, next Thursday. It's a noon to one Zoom session. So that can hopefully capture anyone who may not have evening availability or didn't have weekend availability um, and who can only participate maybe during the day. Um, in which case we can, um, you know, also, and then we'll also have that Zoom link, that recording on the website as well. And um, if you want to go to the last slide real quick, just because, just to... yes, one, one moment, let me just grab this slide just to make a point that if you do have questions and further input after today, um, please do send that to Josh. Um, he is compiling with us where we're creating this um, you know, basically a database of a lot of comments that have been heard to date, and we'll put that all together and put that on the website as well. Um, over the next month, we're, there's going to be a table at Farmer's Market, there's going to be a table on Election Day to continue to promote outreach and education, as well as then giving people opportunities to know how to give the input um, and find, you know, this, this information on the website. There's a sign up to the if you are not already on the mailing list, right on the homepage, there's a button um, that you can find. If you see the flyer that we have here, there's actually a, a, a graphic of the button to find on the website to be able to sign up for the list serve, the mailing list that goes out with updates. There's updates going to be in the bridge and I'm from Porch Forum. So we're trying to find as many ways to get in touch with folks as possible. But again, if you think of another way to get in touch and want to send that our way, and if you want to continue to promote the information from um, 
distribute the information to your networks, we'd be very grateful. And you had another comment? I do. Okay. Steve Whitaker again. Um, I think the confusion around the recreation is partially due to the fact that it was brought to the attention or it was spearheaded uh, initially at the purchase time by the hub folks. And I believe that folks are pushing back against a country club, tennis club type, uh, almost elite, you know, consuming petroleum to go play tennis uh, is not consistent with what our needs are right now. Um, you're also wrestling with uh, a disenfranchised population. We've had so many failed project after failed project. Our, our car lot, our transit center, our district heat system, our French block, our even Pioneer Lane Shop, Pioneer didn't have hot water for six weeks. We've got such a failed management system here that people don't have faith that we can, our input really matters. And people are discouraged and uh, somewhat hopeless, disenfranchised. And to restore that is more than you contracted for, but it really, if you got to, if you want to do your job right, you're going to have to figure that one out. Um, if we're going to do a, you know, a rec hub that belongs like on Green Mountain Drive where people can walk and bike to. You, you, people are not going to bike out to this, especially in the winter, out to the Elks Club property uh, or whatever we're going to call it, Country Club Road property. I, I did like the idea that some people tonight expressed of senior housing combined with modest starter home housing where there's opportunities for folks to afford to live there and care for the seniors at a much lower. I've I've been involved with folks that are paying six or eight thousand dollars a month. And and it's it's insane. And we're all gonna get old and we're all gonna need help. And so if we can actually create some workshops up there, use some of the, the buildings or or different buildings to create a workshop. I, I hate the jargon of maker space, but uh you know, I've I've done wood shop work. There's 3D printing. People can make a living and not have to drive to and from town all the time by living and working on this property. And there can be some light agriculture to support kitchen. There can be a community center. Uh, it it could be a real uh, vital and dynamic outpost of downtown Montpelier that provides food to you know and uh, occasionally come into town to come into the downtown center to 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 shop or uh, attend church. Um, oh. So what we've learned from the transit center is that we hodgepodge folks into section eight and you get people of different educations and different health habits and different uh, family dynamics and you've got people trying to get out because you know mothers are yelling at their sons constantly. It's there's a you can't just hodgepodge people together who come from such varied backgrounds and expect a healthy community to grow. That needs to be very delicate. It needs to be. Uh, I'm not a social worker, but I'm I'm seeing enough of it. Um, So yes, this was a rushed process to purchase that land on short notice. Uh, Ribellini, I'm confident would have held it for another year, but we rammed it through because that's the way we mess things up in Montpelier. Um, that's probably enough for now. Good. And somebody else is okay. raising that thing up. Yeah. Rachel, do you just raise your hand? We're not hearing anything. I, don't... I did, but that was unintended. <laughs> Sorry. No worries. Thank you. Thanks. All right. 
Well, thank you everybody for the participation. We really appreciate it. We had a great um, a great turnout on Saturday. I consider this is also a great turnout, very engaged, active group. So thank you very much. And we hope to see you again real soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.